Please silence all your electronic devices and stand for the invocation by Council Person B. sure that it works. Okay. That yeah, works, so this will be mobile. Council President, members of council, constituents, I appreciate you having me here today to speak about the Batavia Development Corporation, uh, economic development initiatives that uh, Steve Batavia is in the midst of right now. The BDC, or Batavia Development Corporation, is a non-for-profit 501c3, local development corporation that's set up as a tax-exempt charitable organization, which allows donations to be tax deductible. LDCs allow local governments to assist business with specific types of loans and grants, play a flexible role in the public and private sector partnerships, and structure arrangements to purchase and develop real estate, promote tourism, address unique fiscal problems, and much more. The Batavia Development Corporation works to improve the quality of life within the city of Batavia. This overarching goal is a core foundation of, success, of successful economic development that all municipalities face. And that picture right there is from a New York Main Street grant. That is the, the wine glass right over here uh, the new sign. Why is economic development important? Well, as you can see from that picture right there, this is the value of our properties in the city. And the downtown area is that spike in rent. So it is important because it brings private investments, which will add to our sales and corporate tax bases. Business investments will help create new jobs and promote industry diversification, reducing the city's vulnerability to a single industry, and can attract talent with diverse employment opportunities. Building investments will increase revenue in property tax and mortgage taxes, we must also focus on the city and what we currently have, and we must continue to support local companies and organizations and assist with their needs. Improved quality of life is an encompassing term that deals with all aspects of economic development and how that translates to our community and its residents. Economic development is a marathon, not a sprint. Even as projects continue, we must always look to the future to keep the momentum we currently have going. In economic development, understanding the demographics of your area is critical to identifying both strengths and weaknesses. The city population is currently 14,396 people with a median age of 41 and rising. The population has been declining for several years. However, our median income has increased over those years and the poverty rate has also decreased. We are estimated to lose 5,000 
25 to 64 year olds if we are not proactive on our approach. The chart to the right is an estimation of what Genesee County's population uh, change would occur if we do not continue to attempt to attract younger generations and new households. Two point three million people live within sixty minutes from a sixty minute commute from Batavia. There are fifty seven universities and colleges within that commute. And that includes over 17,000 engineering students enrolled. The majority of Batavia residents have at least a high school diploma, and 37% have a college degree. Companies in Batavia, like Graham Manufacturing, Alatka, and many others, have created demand for engineering positions, manufacturing positions, and a variety of skilled labor positions. Our strategic partners at GCEDC work hard to attract diverse manufacturing sectors to Genesee County and they've been very successful in their workforce development. There are new quality employment opportunities available to attract talent. We hope new hires will want to call Batavia their home if they do not already. For example, HD Hood, which is a local company, is planning to hire an additional 200 to 250 employees with diverse positions, effectively doubling their workforce. These people need to be attracted to the city and its amenities if we want them to become productive residents. When we look at the city's occupational data, it shows that about 75% of our workforce commute from neighboring communities. It is estimated that more than 2,000 of these jobs are located within the Business Improvement District and DRI investment areas. This tells us that people are living elsewhere rather than considering Batavia as their home. In addition to their workplace location, we have a tremendous opportunity to attract working talent to the city. One potential deterrent for attracting uh, new households and new talent to our community uh, is our housing stock. The city housing stock is aged. More than half of the homes in the city are more than 50 years old, and many are in need of substantial rehabilitation. This will poise a quality issue when attracting new households and new talent. Rehabilitation of these housing stocks can add character to our community while addressing both quality and safety. Our industrial growth is outpacing our development of quality housing. There is a strong demand for new workforce housing, market rate housing, and low and fixed income housing. Trends show that more new rental units will be needed in the future than owner occupied. The need for higher density units with pedestrian oriented neighborhoods will create more housing downtown, with less of a footprint in physical land use, as well as less of a footprint in car. As we talked about HP Hood earlier hiring positions, those individuals new to the workforce may earn around thirty dollars to $40,000. This would likely apply to other companies as well, like Alatka and Graham. The quality of the city's units are not attracting growing families or young professionals, as shown by our decreasing population. Research has shown that millennials rent more often and for longer periods of time than previous generations. They tend to prefer walkable urban lifestyles that are close to their amenities. They also prefer amenities that have much smaller carbon footprints. They tend to prefer less square footage in their living spaces with a more simplistic lifestyle. We also know that aging populations tend to downsize later in life, and they are having a difficult time finding quality places to live and downsize into, while not jeopardizing their safety or the amenities that they own. Now that we've identified some of the situations the city is encountering, how do we address the overarching goal of continuing to increase quality of life? How do we increase the population in the city? More jobs, talent attraction, rehabilitation of properties, new developments that fit our live, work, play model. What will make Batavia attractive to all generations, entrepreneurs, business owners, and investors? Studies and planning documents are a great way to start addressing the situational downfalls we are currently facing. The city has performed many formalized studies of our market conditions and created areas of focus that will improve the quality of life for our residents. They include a CZB urban planning study in 2010, a Brownfield Opportunity Study in 2014, a City Comprehensive Plan in 2017, and most recently, Downtown Revitalization Initiative in 2018. Throughout these studies, the need for improved and new housing markets for low income, workforce, and market rate, upper floor housing, and downtown resounds, as well as a focus on our Brownfield opportunities. 
Sites that include the mall and city center and harvester. Once we have identified these areas of focus and set our goals, we must take action in executing programs and initiatives that address our areas of need. That is where the BDC is essential to previous, current, and future successes in the city. One way the BDC helps the city to execute these goals that we have identified through that extrapolation is successfully seeking grant programs and funding and then administrating those programs. The city was awarded a $10 million downtown revitalization initiative grant, which promotes the live, work, play downtown lifestyle. So seven projects total, and I also do have a poster board over here that shows the same. Um, seven total projects from residential, commercial, mixed use, and healthy living. $64.6 million invested into our downtown through these major projects, and it proposed 65 new residential units between Elegant Station and Elegant Place. I know the council is looking for shovels in the ground in 2020, and I'm happy to report that I truly believe they will have it. Demo has already begun on Main Street, on the soon-to-be Main, Main Street Theater 56. Excuse me. City Center and Jackson Square have formed steering committees that have already met. Ellicott Station is awaiting funding award, but poised to move quickly if awarded. Ellicott Place is almost ready to begin work as well. Design is underway for the UMFC and YMCA Helping Living Care. BDC will assist these private projects with administrative support and help with alternative and additional funding sources. Our partners at GCDC and BID have also been instrumental in the success of these projects thus far. Similarly, the BDC was awarded a $600,000 DRI business improvement grant. This was created to offer assistance to local building owners and promote continuous and, and promote continuation of transforming our downtown. The BDC is administering this program for each individual project from start to completion. Eight projects were selected. Two, unfortunately, have recently reclused themselves from continuing. But the current projects include 10 proposed residential unit rehabs of upper floor apartments in downtown, 12 proposed commercial unit rehabs, six facade improvements in our downtown, and six interior rehabs environmental testing to ensure longevity. The proposed investment is currently almost $2 million into our downtown buildings. Again, with the goal of shovels in the ground, we have several of these projects close to the contractor selection, and one is actually ready to begin work once the sun is. So there will be some movement on these as well. In December of 2019, the city was awarded a $300,000 New York Main Street grant. This is a matching grant, much like all the others that we run. Proposed projects focus on readiness, facade, residential improvements, and conversion, and commercial and mixed use structures. This program will work very similar to the DRI BIF program. And this traffic graph, this uh, is just an estimate. So, you know, goal would be something like to have a million dollars worth of investment for a three hundred dollar grant, three hundred thousand dollar grant fund. So, this will get updated with actual projects and actual figures after we move forward. On that note as well, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we do have a uh, public information session and presentation on this grant and how it works. Uh, that's at 9 a.m. right here in this uh, council chamber, so all are welcome. To please join. In addition to the grant administration uh, that we do, the City of Batavia Revolving Loan Funding Grant Program is also administered uh, by the BDC. Uh, this program was created to foster new business and promote growth of existing business. The Revolving Loan Program has helped over 60 local businesses with funding. The Revolving Loan Fund Grant Program was created by the city to help further rehabilitate buildings. It is mirrored off of the New York State Grant Program that the BDC has been very successful in administering previously. It is a citywide program with up to $20,000 in grant funding for eligible projects. Three projects have been awarded so far and a total of $60,000 in grant funding. This is a great way for the city and the BDC to expand our vision outside of the downtown area and offer financial support to those projects that fall apart. <coughs> Another unique way that the BDC um, promotes economic development is opportunity zones. So opportunity zones were conceived as an innovative approach to spur long-term private sector investments in low-income communities nationwide. So Batavia House is the only two designated opportunity zones in Genesee County. The two census tracts are designed to include the two largest brownfield opportunity areas as well. 
city center, and harvester. Redevelopment plans are taking shape and will strongly promote new development. And as you can see from the slide here, we're, we're that little arrow, um, but it's a good visualization to show you that opportunity zones are not everywhere. So for us to have an opportunity zone or two of them in the city, uh, it is very attractive to developers, and, and hopefully we can continue on that success. So where are the zones in the city? Uh, they're in our, what we would be considered the poverish zones, or the, work, the, the highly distressed zones. So Ward 3, which has a poverty rate of 21.8, and an unemployment rate of 8.4, and Ward 6, which is 31.2 and 3.2 for unemployment. So these areas are poised for substantial reinvestment through this opportunity <coughs> zone. And how that works is it's a certain tax benefit to investors through qualified opportunity funds, um, which really the sole goal of those opportunity funds are to invest in opportunity zone properties. Uh, in order for the city to stay competitive in its attraction of developers, we must implement these type of urban programs to kickstart our initiatives. Another unique urban development strategy, the BDC was instrumental on pursuing and implementing our brownfield opportunity areas, or POA sites. Now, brownfield or brownfield site is defined in New York State Environmental Cons Conservation Law as any real property, the redevelopment or reuse of, which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a contaminant. Clean up of these sites can, be, can pose a very unique challenge and obstacles. 366 acres in the city was identified in the BOA study. The program provides resources to community like ours to effectively re revitalize these areas and return dormant and blighted parcels into productive catalytic properties as the brownfield opportunity areas make the development much more possible. <coughs> Batavia City Center Revitalization Pathway Prosperity. So this is again uh, another post report that I do have. Uh, but this is an example of how the Pathway to Prosperity will progress for the city center and mall as we undergo and continue to move forward. You can see here that the pieces all culminate together into a major project with substantial uh, investment into our downtown and revitalization. The Harvester Camper Campus is the largest designated BOA area, and again, this too is primed for redevelopment. Brownfield Opportunity Area Sites, um, found through market analysis, reveal strategic site concepts that identify needs in the city in those sites. So, for example, we'd be looking at the need of 400,000 square feet of industrial and warehouse space, 240,000 square feet of additional new housing, 30,000 square feet of office, 18,000 square feet of medical, 8,000 square feet of retail, and a boutique of scale hotel and downtown. If we developed a concept that's over 700,000 square feet of cleanup site in these contaminated areas. So we must continue to support these projects that are willing to take these sites on and invest the resources needed to transform the often pointed areas into functioning, safe developments that will foster, that will last for generations, just like projects of Elgin Station, City Center, and the Alpha Cola and Harvester. The BDC will continue to work diligently at supporting these developments and securing projects that will address the needs that were identified in this study. An unprecedented pathway to prosperity was instituted in March 2016 following months of dialogue between city, county, and school officials. Each taxing jurisdiction agreed to repurpose a share of future pilot payments to leverage private investment made in the city central corridor a unique incentive to advance redevelopment. A five-partner strategic alliance was born for program implementation between Genesee County, the city, city school district, GCADC, and the BDC. Eligible projects must receive a certificate of consistency from the BDC to contribute funds for the continued investment into public infrastructure needs, such as site work, roadways, curbs, sidewalks, landscaping, demolition, and remediation. All of these things benefit As we've gone through these previous slides, this is just showing some of the roles that we've kind of covered and what the BDC does and how we play a key role in the success of our city and continue to focus on growth and improving the quality of life.
So the first one is uh, BDC seeks funding and incentive opportunities. That would be like we did for our New York Main Street grant. Sought that out, applied for it, was awarded. Now we're executing it through administration. Uh, we support the DRI projects. We also administer currently the MIF program, the city's revolving loan fund and grant program, the city's 2020 New York Main Street grant program, Catania's Pathway to Prosperity. We have strategic partnerships with state, local, federal organizations and corporations, including the BIP and GCBDC. Facilitate purchase and development of real estate. Promote improvements to the quality of life. Network with private and public entities, with real estate developers and local municipalities. And investor attraction in opportunity zones and brownfield opportunity sites there. So, uh, so that, I like to think it's quite worth it. Um, successful administration and execution of several grants and programs. So the BDC has been successful in applying, being awarded, and administering several programs which we have just covered. Um, right now, the BDC uh, is administering, let's see, five different grants, or four different grants, uh, with many different projects. Previously successfully administered the 2012 New York Main Street Grant, a USDA Fresh Lab Grant, a 2016 New York Main Street Anchor Grant, Numerous national grid grants and numerous national field grants. The next next BDC we'll be doing is the 2020 New York Main Street program, which I had touched on earlier. All of these programs will bring in an estimated $72 million in capital investment into the downtown, putting the city in a great spot to obtain a long-term goal of over $100 million in capital investment. In the BDC sales funnel, we have estimated 92.6 million dollars of capital investments in both leads and highly likely projects throughout the city, which is an additional 20 million above and beyond the current DRI and New York Main Street projects. The BDC has been a crucial part of creating these unique pathways of opportunity for economic development and its cutting edge urban economic development strategies. In conclusion, as we continue to push economic development forward, it is, it is critical that we continue to not let this momentum stop. The city is in the midst of substantial investment projects, the most that I can ever remember and I've been a lifelong citizen. That will increase the quality of life for our residents, our community, consistently increase our tax revenues, attract new development, new talent, new households, offer diverse employment opportunities, and promote an attractive, healthy, and substantial economic future for generations to come. Now more than ever, the city needs boots on the ground to help all of these projects succeed and continue to identify and capitalize on new opportunities as economic development is ever changing. As I said, it is a marathon, not a sprint. Economic development pieces work together for a common goal, increased quality of life and sustainability. I'm very excited for the future prosperity of the city, and as the economic director of the BDC, and I'm sure my board as well, we will work diligently to see the quality of life increase now and for generations to come. Thank you. between the BDC, the BID, and the GCDC. We're here for business development, help the people that are currently here, and to attract new people to come here, whether it's households, whether it's businesses, new industries, um, arts and culture, healthy living, all of those things kind of culminate together for the growth and prosperity of our, of our, of our city. Um, now, the BDC specifically is, is a local development corporation, so it's set up a little differently in terms of the setup than, than uh, an IDA, which is an, uh, an industrial development agency, and that would be the GCDC. Um, the bid is a taxing entity, um, but we all do have very similar goals, but we all have certain focuses that, that we have to uh, focus on. You know, if GCDC was here today, I think they would probably tell you, uh, oh, Jim, but uh, Steve might tell you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> would, would probably tell you that, uh, that you need the local focus on the city with all the programs that are going on. So, you, you know, you, you can have the over, the over goals, but then you really need the boots on the ground, as I, as I quoted, to, to really push these projects along, to help them with the day-to-day -day operations. You know, I can tell you, I've been working with, with Pat over at Theater 56 pretty frequently to help him with that process, to make sure that the paperwork he's filing is proper, to make sure that we have all the signage up that we need, all, all these types of things. So to have a full-time person just focusing on the city makes sense with the amount of projects that we do have going on. Um, it's, like I said, as busy as I can ever remember it with the most substantial investments I, I can remember again. So now I think more than ever is the time that we do need the BDC, we do need these administrative projects to hit the ground and hit the ground running so we can continue this momentum and keep the ball <coughs> I just want to make understand that the, the GCEDC handles everything throughout Genesee County as far as economic development. You and your board handle all economic development within the city of Batavia and the bid is concentrating and focused just on downtown Batavia within a quarter of downtown. That is absolutely correct. I'm so absolutely. each one of you specializes in a certain area of within within Genesee County. It, absolutely, city. yes. We, we all definitely have our focus 100%, yes. So I, I would be considered, I guess, citywide. It would be specific to, to the taxing district and, as well. And if you, if, you, if you liken that to government, it would be no different than somebody saying, well, we really don't need to take the city council. We'll let the county legislator uh, legislature control the city of Batavia, you know, we each have our own specific Because you understand the community better than right. most of them, yes, absolutely. Just want to understand what the three roles are. Three That's a very good point, Scott, absolutely. Yep. Anyone from the public have uh, questions? Yeah, Mike, you want to come up and talk about the Andrew, as I take it, you're the only employee. The rest is all volunteer board. Right? I, I am the sole employee, yes. So, um, so basically, your budget basically just covers your salary, limited because I mean, your office is here. So you have limited expenses. So you're running on very thin budgets. Basically, your time and effort is what we're, your budget pretty much consists of. It, for the most part, absolutely. Then, obviously, some professional services if we need some attorney, uh, you know, attorney fees, things like that if we're developing a property. So th there will be some additional expenses that, you know, for, for somebody like myself, not an attorney, I wouldn't be able to, to take on. So there, there would have to be a need for some small professional service fees as well. But the majority of the budget is, is salary, correct. Now, another more important thing that kind of we glanced over is when we take our projects like a major brownfield, like the Ellicott uh, Station project, that property was foreclosed on by the city and immediately turned over to you. Mm -hmm to BDC, yep. Yep. which shelters the city from any complications or problems that would occur over there. Absolutely. They now become the BDC's issue, and it takes, keeps the city's liability limited. Absolutely it does. You know, so would you kind of embellish on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. As, a, as an LDC entity and employs for real estate redevelopment, it, it's sort of a safeguard for municipalities, really. Um, and, and we're set up in a manner that we can take on that from a municipality and then promote our redevelopment goals and initiatives <laughs> as a 501c3. So we, we do have, we do take the liability on for that site, 100%. Uh, and, and then we're also a little bit more poised to work with those people that are going to develop that site to help them with the process, what they may need, who they may need to talk to. Um, but, but typically, yeah, those are very difficult projects. I mean, we're, we're talking about very contaminated areas that have been blights for the city for years. So, I mean, they could either you know, continue to stay blights or we can do the best we can and, and support the project that are willing to take on these, these huge, massive undertakings just to clean it up alone, let alone and actually develop it into something productive. So, so basically, well, although the city somewhat, and you can take funding from other sources, you can do a 501c3, mm -hmm. but the city does contribute to your fund, but yet you're not a city employee, you're not, you're not, connected to the city other than working with the city. Correct. And that kind of keeps some of the politics out of it in a way because you're a separate entity. Yeah. And yep. that way no, no pressure is going to come from the city. You're going to do strategic goals and, and best practices based on economic development plus your board is there to make sure everything's up and up, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, yep. because sometimes people are confused like they, they think you're an employee of the city. Yeah, right? I know. The BDC person is, is not. You're a separate agency. Mm -hmm working with the city Correct. And in hand in hand and other agencies as well. And we benefit from all that in many ways by all these multitude of projects and we are the busiest area so we're going to have a large amount of projects and you're one person juggling 
well today. That is correct. Yes, Gino. Uh, and, and you know, we even received recently some uh, uh, national recognition or, or from New York State DOS. Uh, they want to do uh, sort of an interview and study on how we're combining our opportunity zones with our, our BOAs and, and our downtime revitalization. So we're in a very unique situation for, I mean, the state in general with all the programs that we do have, uh, the size we are with, you know, a sole employee. So uh, it is a lot to juggle, but the state's already taking notice with all the great things that we do have in these cutting-edge urban initiatives, which are poising us extremely well for the future and for future development. Anyone else have any questions? If, can I just add one thing to that? And Andrew explained it um, along the lines of what the law provides for, but the local development corporation law provides its statutory authority exists for the LDCs to do that, to own, develop, acquire, lease properties. Conversely, a municipality is not in that business and is not authorized by the general city law or the general municipal law to do that. You can only own properties as a municipality for municipal purposes. Really so there's, there's a distinction. So. Correct. Yes. That's why that's the separate entity that you do, and we benefit, and everybody in the community benefits, including the county, because as the city thrives and provides other opportunities, yep. people on the outskirts are able to benefit from that as well. Yeah, that's why PCEDC needs you as well as you can use their resources at the time. So Absolutely. It becomes a multifaceted approach to it, and, and that's very helpful. Otherwise, you need one person really running. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. Having those partnerships uh, is huge, really. Um, you know, st strategically making sure that we are all on the same page uh, is very important as well. So communication is, is key to this. Um, you know, I meet with GCDC typically weekly, um, meet with Beth very often. So we are communicating on all levels to say, you know, where, where we stand on certain projects, how we can help each other, and how we can all work together to, to benefit this community in the long run. So absolutely, like I said, the boots on the ground in the city is huge right now because of all the massive projects we do have going on, and, and hopefully in the future continue. So basically, when it comes to the city, you're kind of like the, the captain, you're kind of the coordinator, you're kind of leading it, because obviously you're the one who's definitely got your hands deep into all these projects, so you're the one who's in the know and reference them. Yep. For, for the past three months? Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and going on, because now we're getting to that level where all these, now how, in, in the DRI alone, which the DDC, like I was there when it all took place, DDC was instrumental in, on the second attempt of regrouping and helping us get that $10 million DRI. That alone, how many, in that $10 million, what does that translate to in actual matching funds, total projects? You know, we're looking at $64.6 million on the downtown revitalization, $10 million. If you add on the BIF, the BIF, the $600,000, that would be another $2 million. So we're up at almost to about $67 million of investment between $10 million in grant fund. So and quite then, a substantial and investment. And I know the DRA had its own board and whatnot, but ultimately, from my personal experience, without the BDC coordinating all that, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's like six to one, really, right? So you're talking $10 million and you're getting 60 some million dollars and plus out of that in our community, basically right there down there. Yeah. And if we look at that as a matching grant, that, that's, a, that's a great match for us, absolutely, you know. Uh, it's, it's way more than 50-50. Right? Yeah, and I mean, even some of the grants, you know, they can, some are, there's no match, but, but a couple of them there, you know, you usually have matching requirements. New York Main Street, I believe, uh, does, the BIF does, so. You know, to get that substantial of an investment out of the time million, it is absolutely astronomical for the city. That's huge, for sure. Okay, anyone have any questions? What's the time, time frame on that, all this money? It's time to do it in five years. Yeah, yes. The, the DRI is <laughs> do it in five years. So we're going on third year. And Coming up to what a good more than half those projects should be in the ground this year? Yeah, I, honestly, yeah. I, I know GCDC is uh, meeting, uh, they're having their public hearing on Ellicott Station and Ellicott Place. Um, and then, like I said, Main Street is already starting to get demo. Um, so Pat's in there. And then uh, the Business Improvement Fund, the one I'm running, uh, as you can see from, from the bullet points, we are making great progress on that. We, should, we actually have one that's already in contract for construction. They're just waiting for the facade works to, for the weather to break a little bit. So. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, Jill. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on in the city right now. As I remember, the, the uh, Department of State uh, only gave a five-year limit for larger projects. So, for example, the YMCA. They want they were pretty much looking at a two to three year from apply to shovels in the ground, and we're pretty much right on project with 
good 50% of those yeah. with more next year or within the later part of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it is weather dependent because we have, unfortunately, we have winters and it slows us down. Now on the uh, mall part, or the city center, once we get that roof on, that's all interior work that can happen. That can happen throughout. That right. can happen that's throughout the year. So that's that's going to happen just based on what we decide to do. Absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything you like to add? I, I think I just said quite a bit. I appreciate everyone's time. I just, I, I mean, I think you guys are misunderstood, and I just want to make sure that people understand the value for our dollar. Yes. I, I mean, it's, if we look at return on investment, I would say the BDC absolutely has a return on investment, especially in the long-term picture. Bringing in these these entities and increasing, like I said, multiple different revenues, whether it's sales tax, whether it's corporate tax, mortgage tax, those are all going to eventually sort of funnel through the counties and all the municipalities involved with it. So, you know, absolutely, return on investment is there, um, if, as long as, you know, I guess, council and everybody else is agree on that. And, and, and it is a slow process due to the regulations, and the state requirements, and everything else, and, and without your help, I mean, some of these businesses that have never been involved in anything like this, they don't even know where to go, and you would be there to guide them. Yeah, even the, the business improvement projects, um, each project is an individual project. But they all have the same requirements, whether it's you know a, a ten million dollar project or a ten thousand dollar project. So the checklist items remain the same, depending on the size. So each project there has a two-page checklist, and each one of those checklist items typically is a document that has to be either completed, filled, tested. Um, so it, it is absolutely a lot to administer these programs, um, and, and that's on top of you know all the other things that we are doing and, and trying to do for the city. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you. Public comments. Communications. You got Eli Fish is the first one? seen all the application you had that in your packet anybody have any questions on that questions on that okay the application on that any questions okay 
The next regular City Council business meeting will be held on Monday, March 9th, 2020, 7 p.m. at the City Hall Council Boardroom, second floor, City Center. Um, Councilman Bayakowski, um, before we get into the public hearings about the budget, he had something he'd like to read. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I just put together a little synopsis how we ended up in the position we're in, and I'd like the public to be fully aware of what's transpired. Our governor put the city of Batavia into a very difficult financial position within weeks of us having to enact a budget. Between the VLT payments and sales tax computations, we were faced with a $700,000 shortage from the state. The governor stated we don't need the VLT money because of all the other financial benefits the track and casino provide. Keeping in mind, Batavia Downs pays no property taxes to assess at $2,660,000. The small, the little plaza west of Tops pays taxes on two million three hundred thousand, and the closed Kmart, the owners there are paying taxes on four million one hundred thousand dollars. We'd be much better off if that property were developed for commercial real estate. If this is going to quite <coughs> continue, uh, Como is obviously catering to certain voting blocks, and it's confirmed by his exempting the VLT payments from the casino in Yonkers. They have to make the payments to the community down there, but it's a big voting block. And he's also spending a lot of our hard-earned tax dollars in Puerto Rico, which is a federal issue. It's not part of the state of New York. And I have to say I'm really proud of this council, and I'm proud to be a member of this council and our administration. Uh, everybody jumped in. The city manager, he had the first budget all done. We all threw him in the trash, start over. And he went to his department heads. Everybody buckled down. They said, we'll get through it. And they did. And uh, uh, they faced this financial dilemma with, uh, by all working together, and everybody developed a budget within a short period of time. The manager and department heads made this happen. Your council members all set aside their personal political agendas and worked hard on the budget, considering we are all homeowners, so none of us are happy about raising the property tax on ourselves. So we, we are part of the part of the city, part of the community. We're not some foreign entity. We all relented on many items. We all have our own pet projects for each ward, for the whole city. We've all had to give in on some of them. It's, there's things the city just can't afford to do this year. And uh, we've had to cut them, and that's it. But we put together a budget with the least financial burden to the taxpayers. I know we're going to hear, we'll be faced with negative pundits and blogs from some of the naysayers. But I, I feel very comfortable that we all worked as hard as a team with a common goal to get through this crisis. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, um, public hearing. I don't have my worksheet to open and close the public hearing. I'm just going to kind of go off this. Okay. So the first one is going to be the local law of year 2020 this is the uh, exceeding the tax limit so a motion to open the public hearing mr. Bayakowski seconded by Ms. Pacino call the roll yes yes Any speakers? No one if anyone would like to speak, you can speak as long as it's on the uh, exceeding the tax cap. If you forgot to sign up, you're still going to be allowed to speak. Anyone like to speak? Um, I just would like to say one thing. Um, I was very disappointed when the governor's budget came out, especially at the last minute. Um, I know that now that we know what we're facing, we're going to have 12 months to really look hard and as things come up, we're going to take really close looks at them and try to be within our means for next year. The problem was this year we had very little notice. I mean, there, wasn't even, there was really no notice. If it wasn't for us just reading the budget, we wouldn't even know. Um, so I was very disappointed. Was I disappointed with that? Absolutely. Uh, was I disappointed because I have to raise taxes on my own house and I'm a fixed income homeowner just like a lot of people? I was very disappointed, absolutely. Um, 
we looked at three alternatives. Um, there were no good choices. We chose the lesser of three evils. Um, do I think that's, that was the best way to go? Absolutely. Um, so hopefully next year we'll be a little, uh, we'll be able to look ahead. We'll have 12 months to make some tough plans and maybe get back some of the things we gave up, some of the equipment we couldn't afford this year. The school resource officer, maybe we'll be able to work that out a different way and maybe get that maybe later in the year. Um, there is good news. Um, we, we're, we, we did find some money there. Like, for example, the uh, bail reform, that costs us additional money. Uh, the uh, discovery, that's costing us money. Um, maybe not as much because the um, district attorney has found a way to streamline the process to some degree um, with some creative looking at some of the way the law is written, a little loophole there. So they didn't need the additional money from us that we would have to pay for our share of an employee. So that's 12,500 bucks that it's toward the cause that we can put towards this year if we need to later in the year and they're not gonna need it. They're not gonna bill us, right Marty? They're not gonna bill us for that unless it comes down to it. But as of now, it looks like we're pretty much gonna save that money. So you know, 12,500 and a $28 million budget doesn't seem like much, but it is a lot of money and it's starting in the right direction. So. I'm not happy about it. I'm very disappointed about it. But unfortunately, I'm hoping that us doing this for the first time will send a strong message because this has to be filed with the comptroller, has to be filed with the Department of State. And I'm sure the uh, governor is going to see it. And I hope he is not happy about it because we're certainly not happy on this end either. Mr. Chairman, when do we have an opportunity to present our side of what we don't want in this budget? I mean, you've done this before. We should have an opportunity to discuss what we want to take out. And you haven't given us that opportunity. Rosemary, we had several budget well, meetings. That's bullshit. Mr. What you did. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What you we did is we had the department heads, and we have not had an opportunity to present our case. Okay, let me, let me explain okay. something. Councilman Bayakowski asked numerous questions during the budget about every item. You had every opportunity to do the same. He brought up items. Do we really need this? Can we cut this? That was the time. It's a budget work session. But however, you're going to have to wait a minute because I need to close the public hearing. I'll give you a chance to speak and then we're going to open the next public hearing. Okay? Anyone else have anything to say in reference to the tax cap? Okay. Motion to close the public hearing. Mr. Bykowski, second it. Mr. Gross. Call the roll. Yes. Bailey? Yes. Pacino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Perez? Yes. Okay. Meeting's closed. Now, it, to, to, based on your topic, okay. and, and you say this, that I do this every year, unfortunately, every year you wait till the public hearing and you say the same thing, and, and I don't know why. We've explained this to you many times. Really? During the budget meetings is the time to bring it up. And, and you don't like something, you just say it. We want to cut it. And, and we have in the past. And we usually wait till the next meeting and we vote, do we want to make this cut? As a, we, we vote and then we send the city manager back to report back to us. We've done this two or three years I in a row. recall a vote on everything that you were talking about. Forget it. And let me I, I mean, it's not my budget. It's the city manager's uh, budget. We all talk about it. We all had opportunities. Are we voting on the resolution this evening for no. the tax cap? No. It's right here in the resolution. It's, all, all we're doing is, the re, this is a conference meeting. We don't okay. vote on conference right. meetings. Okay. We've had the public hearing. Okay. We are going to take a consensus now. After we go to the public hearings, we will take a consensus to move each one of those resolutions to the business meeting for a vote. Next meeting is when we vote on all three of these resolutions. When New York State Constitution calls for a 2% levy on taxes and nothing higher unless there's over 125,000 people in an area. This legislation. 
Ask yeah. them the question. Can he answer it, please? The legislation also provides for an override by local law by 60% of the authorization of the board who is imposing the tax. In this case, the resolution that's going to be considered if you choose to move it forward provides for that override of the tax cap to 2%. That's the process under the, the General Municipal Law Section 3C. So it's not something the city has done before, obviously, but given the circumstances that have been described and the exigent timing of this, that's something that um, the city management and council is being asked to consider. So then if we don't decide to bring it forth, then we have an opportunity to talk on it again, correct? If there's enough of us to say no? Well, you have a budget process, and you also have a deadline by the charter to adopt the budget, which I believe is March 20th. So to try to keep up, March 20th is a deadline set by charter for, by which council would be responsible for adopting a budget. You generally have a schedule in place that you act on the budget, going through the budget work sessions, going through the public hearing, which is what this is on. There's two more public hearings on the budget ordinance and the water rates as well. And then thereafter, there would be a meeting by which you would adopt those particular ordinances in the case of the budget or local law amendments <coughs> in the case of the water rates. So if you choose to vote against adoption and there were sufficient votes against adoption of the budget, budget ordinance or the water rates, certainly that would call into question the schedule. But at this point, the schedule put forth by the city manager was such that it would keep you on the timeline for adopting a timely budget. Motion to open. The next public hearing is the budget ordinance itself. Motion to open. Mr. Veely, seconded by Mr. Bajkowski. Call the roll, please. Councilmember Veely? Yes. Messina? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? No. Perez? Yes. Bajkowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Any questions on the budget? Anyone like to speak on the budget? I do have two signed up for that. Call them up. Um, wait, hold on, let me go for this first. Um, you're going to have to speak on the budget, not various projects. Each speaker will please use the podium. You'll be limited to five minutes. Please address your comments to the chair. Council will not engage in debate with the speaker. Your first bell, you have 30 seconds left. On your second bell, I'll have to stop you. City Council President, City Council Members, my name is David Twitchell. I reside at 166 Summit Street here in the City of Batavia, and I'm a current member of the City of Batavia Youth Board. And I'm here tonight to speak about uh, the proposed cuts to the youth services budget here in the City of Batavia, and I would like to wish that the Council might reconsider any of these cuts to youth services. We have a brand new youth center located on Liberty Street. It's now called the Liberty Youth Center. And we've moved from our MacArthur Drive location down to this new youth, youth center on Liberty Street. It's the old St. Anthony's complex. And they have done wonderful work there. Um, the attendance this year has increased uh, greatly. We have over 400 of our local city youth registered to use that facility now, almost twice as much as we had at the previous facility on MacArthur Drive, probably because it's more centrally located for the youth of our community. And I would just hope that the council would reconsider cutting any of the youth services budget, because in my mind, what a better way to invest our hard-earned tax dollars in the future than in the, than the youth of our community. Thank you. John Roach, 116 Grandview Terrace. I understand the problem you have with the BLT money. <clears throat> uh, Councilman uh, at large explained it very well. You didn't see it coming. And you've done the cuts you had to do. I understand nobody really wants to raise taxes over 7%. You know, that's not how you gain any popularity. We just heard Youth, or, uh, youth Bureau getting caught. You've cut your police department, your fire department, your public works. My complaint is, uh, no great surprise because a lot of those questions asked earlier were sort of directed to me, uh, on the uh, BDC. 
we're giving them $100,000. A lot of it is to pay the salary for a person that is not a city employee. At the same time, I look and I see, well, that second school resource officer, whose primary function would be to protect kids, isn't going to happen, at least not in the near future. I can't see where you're cutting all the public safety budgets but leaving a non-city function untouched. If you have $100,000 floating around for the BDC, I'd rather see that go and you hire that police officer to protect the schools. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any council members have comments in reference to the budget? Yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I think council liaison for the youth bureau. And the last thing I want to see cut is anything to the youth bureau. I understand that we all have to take hits equally, so to speak. And if there's a chance to restore some of those funds, we definitely want to, you know, you know those funds in particularly take care of our most disadvantaged part of the citizens. And, and it dramatically affects both the fifth floor and sixth floor. Um, I, don't, I don't like the cuts. However, I understand everyone has, has to bear a, a, a vote. That's it. Yeah, I, I'd like to respond to that. I'm a BDC. Uh, we're playing with the cards that were dealt to us some years ago by the state of New York. If we were to cut the funding to the BDC, they would not have a full time employee. It would be pretty hard to get somebody to volunteer the number of hours that uh, the director puts in. Then we would become like some of the cities have become where they don't take abandoned properties for taxes. They just leave them because of the brownfield situation and the contamination. So picture, for example, the Ellicott Street project just walking away from it. They didn't pay the taxes. We're not taking it. We have no avenue to take it. Without corporations like the Batavia Development Corporation, we'd be in real trouble. We have a a property I think we still own, uh, don't own for that very same reason and, and it becomes very complicated and you see a lot of this in the bigger cities where the taxes haven't been paid for years, buildings are falling down, the city doesn't have the money to demolish the buildings or even board them up and secure them and once you, once you start down that road uh, you might as well just leave the community because it's going to be a ghost town and I, I sympathize with Mr. Roach, everybody has to make cuts and uh, I, we certainly didn't give anybody any raises there, that's for sure, so thank you. Um, the other thing, and I've been here all my life, and I've seen projects come and go, and the city always has a lot of aspirations, and they mean well, and we end up with like urban renewal. We knock half our main street down, and we crash and burn. And then we get to a level where we're right there, we're right on the edge, and we're ready to go over, and then we chicken out or we crash and burn again and we just go back the way we came and we never get over that ridge. Um, this, we had all these things going for us and then this came and it took the wind right out of our sails. I know it did to me because I thought, I thought here we go again. We're right here with all these projects, ready to get going and then $700,000 we didn't expect. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not happy about it, but I'm not giving up that easy. Um, it's easy to do. We could just throw our hands in the air and say, hell with it. Let the, everything just rot. Let's go down the way. Moan and groan. Post about it online. Complain. Um, I, I'm taking a different route. At this point, you know, I'm not giving up so easy, and I'd like to see us get over this once and for all. And I want to see these projects go down. I want to go down Main Street and see cranes and shovels and bulldozers or whatever. And I want to see that though upon a property cleaned up. And I'm not happy about that either. I mean, I know it took so long, and, and, but I think it's good for the community, and I think our patience is going to pay off. Um, and, and again, there were cuts, and it was kind of done in a hasty fashion. Um, it wasn't irresponsible, but it was done in a hasty fashion. And, you know, we had no choice. Now we have 12 months to plan, and I'm hoping that maybe other things will come forward or maybe midway through some of that money might come through or we'll find new sources of income or by some of these projects being on the ground our tax base will increase 
so that we'll get some extra money in. Sales tax generated by these businesses that will be expanding, that will come back to us as well. So maybe by the end of next year, um, and of course, if we've already matched and reached it, we're going to have to try to find 350000 to make back those cuts that we did this year. I'm hoping that some of that will come back in tax revenue, sales tax, maybe some state money, maybe some of that money will come through. And like Councilman Bayakowski said, that was once on the tax rolls, and it came off, and we were given money in lieu of losing that tax income. And now it's gone. So I totally understand, and I'm not happy about it, but again, I'm not giving up so easy, and I think as a community we need to pull together, and we need to tighten it up a little bit, and we need to go forward. And, and if that VLT money ever does come back, you could be damn sure we're not going to be using it to offset the tax base. We're going to be pr protecting it and maybe reserve funds and things like that. But, we're, but we kept two zeros the last two years based on public pressure, trying to keep the taxes down, and we tapped into that VLT money for the first time in the several years we've been getting it, and now it came back to bite us. So I just wanted to piggyback on something you said. Like you said, we'll have a year, so if we get any extra money, some of these things that we had to we can, to Yeah, we absolutely can. We, we could, we could you know, refund those things for sure. During the budget meeting, I mean, I was really happy. I mean, I really want to see some of these cuts restored, like to the fire department and the police department. Sure. Because again, it's safety issue. So those are my. Oh, absolutely. And and again, as as we get closer to the, I mean, you don't you, you have a twenty eight million dollar budget. You don't go buy every piece of equipment on January for, or on uh, April first. You you space it out. That's the technology, or that's the best practice is spacing that purchase out. So then in the event something comes up, you don't, you don't purchase it, you got that money to use towards the emergency or something like that. So we're going to spread it out, but hopefully, and I'm still confident that we have our legislator and our senators, and we're not the only community affected by this, and NICOM, they're, they're pushing hard to try to get some of that money or part of that money or all of that money restored. In a city our size, uh, $700,000 is a lot of money. Uh, the city the size of Buffalo, $700,000 is not as dramatic as it is to us. Uh, and the town is suffering for $162,000 in the, in the town. is causing them to raise taxes even more than our 7%. But thank you, Councilman so, for bringing that, straightening it out. So we're not the only one suffering, and we're not the only one upset. Um, and, and it was just a really, you know, for Mr. Economic Development in Albany, he really took the wind out of our sails on this one. He really didn't help in, in any matter, shape, or form. But again, we're still hoping and confident that some of this money is going to come through or other things will. And I think that's where BDC really plays an important role by getting these projects in the ground and getting that generated sales tax, property tax income. That's generating income, and it's, I would have hoped we'd have had that more in play before all this happened, but we're a little behind. But I think if we tighten up, we're going to get through it. And we'll get to it, and in the next couple of years, it's going to balance out. And that, that's my, my hope, and that's our plan. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. Council President, if I could, I've been talking, of course, with my colleagues over at the town and the county who have also been impacted by this. They have gone to their respective elected bodies and asked them, and they are in whatever various stages of, of looking at resolutions, asking for the restoration of the VLT funds. We have prepared a draft that we can provide to you as council members, and if you're amenable, we can come back with a special conference and a business meeting on March 9th to adopt a resolution calling for the restoration of that cut and to, yeah, to let us know. In the meantime, there is a letter that I'm going to have that, that we'll, they'll have in their hands uh, well before your March 9th meeting, but I wanted to let you know that, that our effort is underway on our side to do that. And I also wanted to give some compliments to some of our department heads because they have been going and looking at things like contracts with electrical companies and, and looking at trying to and in some cases getting successfully negotiated lower rates and those types of things that will I think play well for us here in the coming fiscal year so I wanted to let you know that our staff is working on that in addition to working on additional grant funds to cover some of the holes that have been left because of the cuts that we've had to make. Anyone else? Okay, motion to close public hearing. Mr. Bikowski, second. Call the roll, please. Councilmember Bikowski. Yes. 
Jankowski? Yes. Bealy? Yes. Casino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Perez? Yes. Okay, the next public hearing is the um, water rates. Motion to open the public hearing for the water rates, Mr. McGinnis. Seconded by Mr. Bealy. Call the roll. Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Casino? Yes. Canale? Yes. Anyone signed up to speak? Anyone like to speak on the water rates? Um, would it be appropriate to just have Matt come up and kind of go overview of where how, raising and what's the purpose of this? And I know there's a bad story for this, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't for the water rates. Good evening, council members. It's <laughs> yeah. my. Uh, Is that the lower electric rates we negotiate? <laughs> my magnetic personality. I, I think we need to renegotiate. Lick your finger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. What, what? Uh, the, uh, the the water rates the the program to increase the water rates goes back uh, really about ten years. There was an initial study done to evaluate what our water rates were, what our future needs were. We also developed a capital plan moving forward to make those investments into our water system. Not unlike most communities in the Northeast, our water system is over 100 years old, and there's been some levels of neglect, and those investments need to be put back in there. I am <clears throat> uh, you know, pretty proud to say that the, the city of Batavia, I think, has done very well in the last 20 years or so that an awful lot of water work has been completed. And uh, for example, in the past year, uh, you know, we did major projects on Union Street, South Main Street, Brooklyn, and we've, I think, been pretty successful at trying to leverage those investments into additional uh, improvements on projects as well. So for example, it's not just that there's a new water line, but the fire protection is increased whenever that happens. Uh, you know, old, old communities like, like Batavia with older water systems, a lot of lead services, as those replacements happen, those lead services are replaced and, and removed as well. And on top of it, we have uh, in, instituted a program uh, some of it is because you have to have separations between your sewers and other uh, utilities that is a relatively new uh, procedures. Uh, a lot of our new water line ends up under the sidewalk, and then when the project's done, there's a new sidewalk that ends up as part of the project as well. And that you know, has always been a, a hot button issue here in Batavia. So you know, and a lot of investment has happened, and we also have a lot of investment planned for the future. So coming up this year, uh, it might be in the, the next spring, uh, there's a, 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 a project to replace somewhere between 50 and 100 uh, additional lead water service lines. That's through grant funds uh, that is targeted primarily uh, in the uh, uh, South Swan area is where we're looking right now. That's, that's to be tightened up, that is the intent. We also have the projects coming up for Harvester and Richmond Avenue. We have some water projects that are included with that. Again, we're trying to make leverage those funds, those investments so that they're part of a larger project, so it's done at a, at a lower cost. So uh, there, there are several projects that are planned in the future, and they, these, these increases were designed to help uh, um, fund those, those investments and also to keep the fund strong. In addition, the city is a wholesale purchaser of water, and the county uh, adjusts the wholesale rate by the CPI annually, so our cost to purchase water is increased, and it's not just a, a one for one because we purchase every single gallon that comes out, yet some of that water gets used for firefighting, some of it's leaks, so you don't recover, there's not a, a return in, on your funds for that. So some of it has to cover that cost as well. And then the, the kind of the third piece of this is that the water fund does help support some of the general fund. There is uh, transfers that happen out of the, the water fund into the general fund, as well as it helps support some of the, uh, the employee costs that are split amongst that as well. So there's you know kind of several different pieces that go along with this, as well as you know the, the, the it's people <coughs> drinking water, right? So we want to make sure it's safe. We want to make sure it's good for the people. We want to make sure it's reliable, and uh, we keep making those investments moving forward. Uh, it is our intent to review the rate structure, uh, looking another five years out. Uh, we just started to, to gather that information now uh, so that we know right where we stand. We've been fortunate the last couple of years of projects that have been completed under what we had budgeted. So we think that the, the stability might be there where the time for these annual rate increases has leveled off 
We just need to make sure that that's right so we can continue to make sure that the fund is strong. So, so we're not caught short, in other words, coming down. Correct. Where a product can't get done because we didn't think ahead and raise the rates slightly to. Right. Well, or to have you know, some large uh, uh, you know, mishap where there's you know, an un unforeseen large expense that might uh, come up. You know, we've we've uh, recently had two uh, water main failures on state arterials. You know, those are those are more costly repairs. Uh, the, the traffic control that goes is involved, and we need to look at that probably the next time the state does some work on those roads. You know, hopefully sooner later, um, that we'll have some funds able to make water line improvements as well, so we're not digging in that road again. Does this cover lead service? <clears throat> lead service lines? The lead service project that we have planned is fully a Department of Health grant. Okay. However, we are still trying to make that a priority because the new lead laws and lead regulations that are coming down are going to make that more and more restrictive. And the idea is, over the next you know however many years, we want to eliminate all of that, right? So. That's, that's so, so, basically, so basically what you're saying is this is like a strategic planning that has been in process for the last 10 years to gradually increase these rates to cover these projects that we knew in the future were going to have to be done. At some point things wear out and we, we knew we had to keep on them. Otherwise they would break and fail and we'd be in emergency mode. So this is kind of like a preemptive. It, it's, it's proactive rather than reactive, the best right. we can. And then the, the, you know, the one other item I, I to consider is your water rates are paid by the entire community. So your, your uh, non-taxable entities uh, pay your water bill as well. So they're not exempt from a property tax. Like that. So that helps, uh, you know, wherever it helps split that pie up a little bit more as well. And if I remember in the budget process, there was some um, reconsidering on some of the resources coming out of the water fund to pay for some of the, I mean, wasn't there, because I know you guys reevaluated some things. I remember there was some talk about, you know, we put that in the water fund and we moved that over because it was more feasible, it made more sense, because it technically was being work done for the water so yeah. that it, it, it could pay them that. You know, our dumpster contract, it was something, exactly. uh, that, that was one of the items, you know, the, the dumpster at the sewer plant should be paid for by the sewer fund. The dumpster at the water plant should be paid out of the water fund. Instead of coming out of the general fund. Which exactly. So, you know, as we go through, we try to refine those anytime we come across those, absolutely. And I would just mention, it just quite often they get thought of as one bill. There's separate entities, the water and sewer. It comes on the same bill, there's no change in the, in the sewer rate. So the sewer rate is, is flat. Um, so as far as the totality of that bill that comes in, it's not going up to 3.5% uh, because the sewer portion of it has stayed flat and has remained flat for several years now, and the sewer fund does remain strong. So when you get a water bill, it's only a small percentage of that bill is going to reach the increase, not the whole bill. <laughs> right. It is. Yeah, the, the Can water you give us like an average? Uh, I, I would say the, the water, uh, I think water is around $5. I don't have the, the reach right for $5.40, maybe somewhere in there. Uh, your sewer bill is around $3. So, you know. If somebody had a $100 average water bill, just rounding it up. Right. What part of that would be increased? Uh, so you would have 3% uh, of about 60 bucks. so you know, maybe two dollars of it. So yeah, you're, you're not going to tax the whole. You're not going to raise. So a hundred dollar water bill, three and a half percent increase would be three dollars and fifty cents. You know, in, right. in, in reality, with this one, that increase is probably going to be about two dollars because your water, your sewer portion in the state is zero. And, and it's one bill, but it's actually two things in that one. Two different utilities, and only one of those parts is going to be increased. That's correct. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you explained that. Just going to keep that first part. Council, I have any concerns? So a motion to close the public hearing. Mr. Bealey. Seconded by Ms. Briggs. Call the roll, please. Council Member Bealey? Yes. Christina? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Perez? Yes. Bykowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. The public hearings are closed. Now we have the local one, law one number one, authorizing to uh, exceed the tax cap. Are we in consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote? Okay. So we, let's take a vote on it. Call the roll. Yes. Council Member Bailey? No. Castino? Yes. 
Bailey? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? No. Perez? Yes. Bykowski? Yes. Okay, that moves. The next is the budget ordinance. And, and just, uh, just a, um, as a mention, in the event, at the last minute, the state budget is pretty much on the same time as our budget. And if they are on time, which they usually have been, um, if at the last minute the state reinstitutes that VLT money, we can revert back to the original projected budget of the city manager, which was, what was it, a point nine increase just to cover the additional, well, there was some workman's comp or some other expenses or something. Marty, do you remember what the, there was a slight tax the increase. Was right, so that would revert back. We could easily do that because that was the original budget and then this came down and we had to change that. So there is a mechanism for at the last minute for us to go back to that. Because that was a question asked if we can fund these things. That's another way that it might happen. With this pressure, there's a possibility, a slim one, but there is a possibility. Okay, so we have the 2020 2021 budget ordinance. Are we in consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote? Yes. Anyone not want to move that for a vote? Call the roll, please. Council President Jankowski? Yes. Council Member Bailey? No. Castino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? No. Perez? Yes. Bykowski? Okay, and the um, establishing the new water rates, meter fees, capital improvement fee. Are we in consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote? No. Call the roll, please. Council President Jankowski? Yes. and close out resolutions uh, mr. president I, okay I'm supposed to eat this thing they told me so I'm going to eat it microphone as is